My name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. Over the past few episodes, you've been seeing a lot of the adventures and frankly misadventures of my two Kerbin runabouts, the Karayan 1 and the Karayan 2. And this culminated with me abandoning the Karayan 2 and her four person crew in orbit about Minmus and me sending out the refitted Karayan 1 at the conclusion of the last episode on a rescue mission to try and bring those Kerbals back. And with the Karayan 1 on its week plus journey out towards Miss Minmus, this afforded me the opportunity to start taking a look at some other vessels. So you're going to be seeing a lot of different vessels in this particular episode. Uh, we're going to be trying to polish off a few contracts. It's a, a new trend I'm trying to get into is actually polishing contracts off and making us some cash. So right here what you see is MapSat 5, the mission for which I will be getting to uh, very, very shortly. But also in this episode you'll be seeing both of my two asteroid chasers. I have two asteroid catching missions uh, on the go. One of which is going to be finished off and the other one is closing in on its D-class asteroid. You'll be also seeing uh, another mission out to an anomaly, a Kerbin jet flying mission. I haven't done one of those in quite some time. You'll be also seeing Moho 1. We need to make a correction burn on its way out to Moho. Yeah, we don't want to forget about our interplanetary crafts as well. But I think the highlight is going to be the installation of a new lab module onto my Kerbin station. I think that will significantly improve both the look and functionality of the station because uh, it's not just a lab module, it will have a hitchhiker can attached to it which will increase the living space on Kerbin Station by 150% and it also has a new antenna and solar array also all in the same, it's all going to be on the same launch so uh, we'll see how that goes putting that all together but why don't we get to MapSat 5. Now this is not the first time you've seen this particular vehicle, this this uh, vessel had, well, an unfortunate problem with its parachutes. When I went to 1.1 and with the mods I had installed, there was a bit of a parachute glitch going on. Uh, the drag model wasn't quite working right, and uh, this 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 went to a uh, explosive demise. <laughs> so this is my second attempt at launching MapSat 5, and the original premise of this particular mission was just to put it into orbit around the moon, but... Well, last episode, I sort of uh, botched a uh, part of a contract to put a satellite into orbit about the moon in this sort of retrograde inclined orbit here. And I thought, you know, this thing has quite a bit of fuel in it. I bet you I can get it into that orbit, finish off this contract, and then readjust it into a more appropriate sort of polar mapping type of orbit after that. So I'm going to try and kill two birds with one stone with this particular mission and send it on its way first to see if I can get it into this uh, contract requiring orbit. But before I had a chance to execute this lunar injection burn, well, I had an asteroid that required some attention. This is the Arm B, now 60 days into its mission. Finally closing in on finishing this contract to put a B-class asteroid in orbit about the moon. And I'm just finishing off a minor correction burn here to adjust my trajectory. What I want to do is I want to put it into a polar orbit about 50 kilometers around the moon. Uh, I'm going for a polar orbit because I kind of want to make this the basis of a station. Oh, that's looking pretty good. Yeah, I want to build a station around this. Uh, start harvesting some resources and really start science mining the moon. It has been a while since we last visited this mission. The last we saw it was right after it had its adventures arrow breaking around Kerbin. Uh, this, this, this problem arising because dang it had stolen away my one and only battery bank. So this thing was heavily electrically, uh, deficient. Let's put it that way. So controlling its attitude as it went through the curve, as it went through Kerbin, uh, was a bit of an adventure. Thankfully it survived and, uh, we last saw it after I had managed to get an encounter with the moon, but... The journey there was unfortunately a long one, but the day for the capture has finally arrived. 
And as always seems to happen, that day turns out to be a busy one. So I had to hop back to MapSat 5 just long enough to perform that Mooner injection burn. And then it was back out to the arm B, time warping into periapsis to perform this capture. It's kind of interesting. I no longer have Dang It installed, yet the battery still doesn't work. If you take up the, you look up there and look at my electrical charge, you can see I only have 15 units of electrical charge, and that is just what is stored inside the probe body. The battery isn't working. Uh, I'm not sure if it's fixable now that I don't have Dang It or not, but I, I can't, you know, I, I, it'd be nice to. Oh, there goes uh, camera change. We must be uh, getting our, oh, yep, we just got our capture. Contract requirement has gone green. However, I do have quite a lot of Delta V. I want a better orbit than that. I want a circular 50 kilometer polar orbit because again, I want to uh, build a station around this and start doing some resource harvesting based on this asteroid. And that means sending out some Kerbals. So hopefully we can still fix this thing up and send it on its way and maybe it can capture some more asteroids. It's still a functional probe. And there we go, we are done. We just gotta wait for our 10 seconds and finally, this contract is polished off. There we go. Okay, and with that done, let's get ourselves back to Kerbin. Now I'm not going to spend much time with this mission because this is a contract you've seen not just once before but twice before. Uh, we are on our way to the pyramids. Yes, this is my third trip out to the pyramids, the third time I've gotten this contract. Um, it seems every time I upgrade Kerbal Space Program to another version, uh, these anomaly surveyor contracts get reset or something, I don't know. Um, I'm a little reluctant though not accepting it for two reasons. Number one is, let's face it, this is pretty much free money heading out to uh, the pyramids. But number two, uh, I'm not really sure. If I don't accept this, will it keep spawning more of these anomaly surveyor contracts? I don't know. I don't know quite how these contracts, uh, how the whole system quite works, but I thought it'd be better to be on the safe side, accept this contract. Hopefully that will mean I will get some other contract that is in this pack and I'm just noticing uh, I wasn't paying too much attention to the seat assignments here I got Wilman in the cockpit Wilman's flying while Valentina is leisurely hanging out in the crew cabin with Carol oh well <laughs> if anything goes wrong we know who it is to blame so this is actually not only the third time I've gone to the pyramids this is the third different plane <laughs> I brought to the pyramids each time I've gone with a different plane though this one thanks to its reverse thrust mode certainly was the easiest one to drop down there by the pyramids all right okay let's increase thrust a bit of course we're going in thrusting in reverse boom there we go nice short stop and you can see there in the X science window, I do have a little bit of science to collect from various instruments, but nothing that's too uh, worth really talking about. But we'll, you know, we'll finish off this contract by getting close enough. We'll get our Kerbals out. We'll do a little bit exploring. Uh, even Valentina decided uh, to do a little bit of mountain climbing. To be fair, I actually saw pictures of somebody else doing this. I didn't realize you could climb up this statue. It is a little glitchy, as you can see on her ride down. Uh, I don't think the collision mesh and the texture mesh are quite in the same spot. <laughs> but anyway, uh, once this foolishness was all over with, it was time to just get everybody back in the plane and head on back. And once these folks were resting comfortably back at the KSC, it was time to head back out to MapSat 5, which had now entered into the moon's sphere of influence. Okay, we're just a little bit more than a minute away from our node. It's a 34 second burn, so we'll split that in half. We only have to start maybe, I don't know, 20 seconds or so before the node. I, I'm using the flight computer to lock onto the node, though I plan on doing the burn manually, though. The, the vessel seems to be rolling. Eh, electricity doesn't seem to be an issue, so that's okay. You can see I got the orbital requirements I need in the contract plus window there on the right, and oh, wait on, wait, hang on a second here. Uh, at the bottom here it says I need to have a thermometer on this vehicle. 
This is a mapping satellite. I'll oh, shoot. Okay, wait, wait. I'm <laughs> almost at periapsis. Okay, I gotta abandon. I'm not gonna do this burn. Abandon this. Uh, get rid of that. And uh, we're just going to burn in a retrograde direction. There we go. And just get our capture and get our apoapsis down to a point so it's not a ridiculous distance away. But I don't want to bring it in too close because I'm going to have to make a major plane change. So there's no point trying to get the orbit that uh, that the contract requires because I won't be able to fulfill the requirements of the contract anyway. Okay, there we go. Apoapsis is a little more than three hours away. Actually, more importantly, the ascending node is a little less than five hours away because that's where I'm going to be needing to make my plane change. So I set up this burn here that actually is not only changing the plane to be in a polar orbit, but also adjusting periapsis to put its altitude at 250 kilometers, which is the final altitude I'm shooting for for my mapping orbit. Man, this contract to get into this stupid orbit around the moon is really... Uh, Testing my ineptitude, <laughs> I seem to find more and more ways in which not to pull this simple contract off. Well, anyway, this thing was initially intended only as a mapping satellite, so that is what it will be in the end anyway. So I suppose no loss there. Okay, there we go. Circularization complete. As you can see, I've already opened up the resource scanner up there at the top of the satellite, as well as ScanSat's multi-spectral analyzer mapping biomes of the moon. We'll leave this thing to do its job. But in the meantime, we've got to go outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence and check on a couple of doing-ons out there. These are both small correction burns that uh, we won't spend much time with, but uh, I don't want people forgetting about these vehicles, that they're out there and they are on a mission. So this here, this is the RMD on its way to a D-class asteroid, and while I'm fiddling around with the lights, it's performing its correction burn. That will bring its closest approach down to about 84 kilometers, and that will be in three days and four hours. So uh, we'll check back on this, say, three days from now. So that should be in a soon-to-come episode that we will be encountering our D-class asteroid and hopefully wrangling it. Uh, and this one actually needs to go to Minmus, so it'll be interesting trying to hit Minmus with it. And the other one here is Moho 1, obviously on its way to Moho, now almost 19 light seconds away from Kerbin. I like saying that. I'll leave it for you to do the math. You can figure out what that distance is in kilometers, but what it means from a practical standpoint is every command I put in takes 19 seconds before it gets executed, so that makes the flight computer that comes with remote tag pretty much essential. Anyway, it is also performing, of course, a correction burn. It's just a tiny one. And there we go. We'll put it back on its custom heading for the solar panels, make sure they're getting nice and charged, and take a look, and oh, that looks pretty sweet. But that's not going to be for another 40 days, so that's obviously going to have to be for some episode in the future. So right now, why don't we get to this episode's main event? This is a mission that has been put off for entirely too long. I designed this mission a long time ago, but it has been on again and off again so many times. Um, it's been it's 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 been getting rather frustrating. Uh, the problems with this mission began actually uh, quite a number of episodes ago when this exact vehicle you see here just blew up on the launch pad. Uh, that turned out to be some sort of strut glitched that didn't rear itself uh, until I changed versions of Kerbal Space Program in a previous upgrade to this particular series. Uh, I fixed that particular issue by simply restrutting the vehicle. Uh, put it back into the building queue again and then when it was only a day or two away from being built and finally being launched well I uh, took it out of the building queue because I had this plan that I was going to get rid of TAC life support something that I never ended up doing and this thing is actually equipped with a TAC life support water purifier and carbon extractor that will take the waste water and carbon dioxide and turn them back into potable water and 
uh, oxygen respectively at least return some of it back so that will extend the life of this particular station without it needing to be resupplied and since this is the station it also resupplies the life support of my various curb and runabouts uh, that's going to be a useful thing as well but now you see it is finally on its way up to Kerbin Station and as the name implied this is a lab module but it's got quite a bit on it besides that as well. Um, I mentioned earlier in this episode it has another hitchhiker can attached to it so um, it will increase the uh, capacity of Kerbin Station from 4 to 10 so that will be good. But lab modules and water purifiers and carbon extractors don't come without an electricity cost. So this thing has a mountain of new batteries that are coming up and uh, two giganter solar panels to help power the whole thing. They are actually going to be necessary. And in fact, I actually brought up another two gigantors um, because I want to attach those to the Karayan 1 because Karayan 1 now has a lab module and we can use the Gigantors to power the lab module when they are researching science because uh, Prime 1 is rather electrically starved. It uh, has had a habit of burning off every solar panel that I put on it. So hopefully the Gigantors can survive the arrow breaking that it always ends up doing a little bit better. And then I thought, well, while I was building the tower to put on the Gigantor solar panels, um, why not? Put on some more dish antennas. Um, may not be practical, but uh, I thought they'd look good for looks. So I had this sort of antenna panel array that has to be attached, as well as the lab module and hitchhiker can. So we'll take a look at how that is all going to happen in just a little bit. But right now, I'll talk about the last component that is going to orbit here. I got a little tug down there at the bottom. The tug is not much more than a probe body, a docking port, uh, a 2.5 meter monoprop can, and six of those puff puff monoprop engines. Uh, that's about it. I, monoprop, I think, is quite often an underutilized form of propellant. It is m useful for more than just maneuvering thrusters. So there we go, we just extended the Gigantors, and it seemed like only one extended. Why did that happen? Uh-oh. Oh, I don't see a Gigantor on that other side there. There is just a stub. Yeah, I can't even click on it. Shoot! That other Gigantor must have broke off when the fairings separated. Ah, oh, darn it. Okay, well, I do have, as I mentioned, another pair of Gigantors that were meant for the Karayan. I suppose I can move one of those over there, so at least the station will look decent. Oh, that's too bad. I'll have to figure out how to get another uh, Gigantor solar panel up here. Okay, so we are about 100 meters from the station. We've brought our relative velocity down to just under a meter per second, so it's time to start the first round of this docking process. So let me get to the right docking port. There we are, the upper berth. That's the one I'm going to be going for. And we'll spin ourselves around. We'll also step this up to four times speed. So this won't take so long for you. This is a bit of an ungainly vehicle. Uh, the only reaction wheels are down there by the tug. I didn't want to put any re other additional reaction wheels on any of the modules being attached to the station. I did put some RCS blocks up there uh, at the top of the lab module, but the thing still isn't very well balanced. So it is a little bit ungainly, but it should work. We are, we'll just use the camera focus changer so that we'll have the camera focused on the docking port. That'll make our view a little bit better. And we just need to drift backwards. I can see here, yeah, let's rotate this so that the solar panels will be over the fuel module and habitation module so they will not be in the way of any approaching spacecrafts coming into dock. Okay, we are now ahead of the docking port so we're slowing down our central axis velocity. Change our view a little bit and we'll just slide in here sideways. Now, this is there's two components here. This is just going to be the antenna and 
solar panel array that's being attached right now. It's just sort of a tower. And there's a docking port there that I'm going to detach as soon as we are docked. And then the lab module is going to a different location than what we have here. Why don't we select the docking port, stick it over here to the side so we can be ready to decouple that node as soon as we are docked. And then we'll back away the lab module and we'll move it someplace else. Okay, just about there. Everything looks pretty well lined up. Boink, there we go. Okay, decouple that node. Okay, uh, let's back off here a bit. Oh. Oh shoot, that's the RCS on the whole station. <laughs> okay, I have the wrong thing selected. Okay, so I just shifted vehicles and backed off a bit with RCS. There we go. Now we can see the lab module. That wasn't particularly clean. And you can see my little antenna array and solar panel there. The sun's come up so we can see things a little bit better now. So let's select this docking port. And we're going to put this at the aft end of the station next to the hitchhiker can that is already there. While I perform this second docking, draw attention to the contract plus window down there at the bottom right. Uh, this is a bit of a bonus contract. I wasn't thinking about fulfilling this one. It's a contract to point a dish antenna to one of the outer planets. And so I was like, okay, I'll have to launch another satellite uh, to do that. And then after launching this one and taking a look at the dishes that I do have, that large uh, dish antenna that is on the antenna array is actually capable of reaching out to Drez. So I simply pointed it to Drez and the shakeout time started. It's got to do four hours of remaining active, or four hours, four days, I'm sorry, of remaining active. It doesn't matter that Kerbin gets in the way of the beam. All that is required is that it is still receiving a signal from the Kerbal Space Center, and thanks to my um, complete coverage of uh, Kerbin for communications, it, it will not lose communication. So yeah, bonus contract, can't complain about that. Anyway, we are just about there, and... Boom. All right. Oops. Turn off the RCS there. <laughs> okay, let's take a look. Get rid of that. It doesn't, I see, ah, it does not look bad. Certainly looking more like what I think a space station should look like, but we have some work that we still have to do, and so it's time to pull out, well, the person who has become our in-space workhorse partner, Bartner's got himself some strutting to do. Then while we head him down there, oh, the station is rotating. That's all right. Let's do a quick time warp here. I'm giving myself a bit of permission to use the time warp trick to stop rotation. I think it's silly that the station rotates when it's not active. Vessels just do that whether they are SAS compatible or not. So I've given myself permission to do those kind of things. But anyway, uh, I want to show a couple of new parts that I did take advantage of the fact that this was being rebuilt to add here. I have these storage lockers. Uh, these come from uh, the Mark I Laboratory Extensions mod or mole. You'll be seeing that a lot more in upcoming episodes, but I took advantage of the rebuild of this thing uh, to stick just stick these onto the side and what I really like about them is they look like sort of your high school or locker room style storage lockers. I think they're kind of neat but they they uh, they can hold, they work with KAS obviously so what we'll, I brought up some more strut endpoints and Bartner's going to head on up there to uh, attach those struts and not only attach some struts but remove these unnecessary RCS blocks. He's also going to be removing some of these unnecessary docking lights, the navigation lights that are up here. Uh, lighting up docking ports that are no longer accessible, that certainly doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to hang on to these RCS blocks. I'm collecting way too much of this kind of stuff. It's really turning into a bit of a junk pile up here. So what Bartner's going to do is he's just going to attach them to the little tug that's down here at the bottom. So, uh, you know, once we're all done, we are going to take this tug and deorbit the thing. So it'll take these RCS blocks with it. And then Bartner's job is still not done. He's got to fix that busted solar panel by replacing it with one of the spare ones that I brought up meant for the Karayan 1. 
Okay, he can grab it. That's good. It's not too big for him to grab by himself. And we will stick it on here. There we go. I think that'll do. And then he's going to have to strut up this tower as well. And uh, I had a few extra lights kicking around, so I thought... Now, why don't we see if we can attach some more lights onto this thing and light this station up a little bit better. Okay, just using a little bit of the fine rotation. Try and see if I can get this angled just the way I like it. I think it's getting pretty close. There we go. All right, and whoa! Oh my gosh, where'd that go? Oh, I guess that wasn't attached after all. <laughs> okay, partner, we're going to have to go find this thing. It uh, went down this way. Oh my gosh. I don't see. Oh, yeah, let's. Okay, so a small black object just went rocketing off into space. <laughs> okay, this is going to be fun. Okay, there it is. And let's see, what angle are we at here? Okay, it's not that far from the station. Come on, partner. Now that we have a bit of a fix on which direction it went. Oh my goodness, it's got to be down here somewhere. Oh, wait, wait, I think I see it. I don't know if you see it, but I think I see it. I just got a little bit of a glimpse of it. There it is. You should be starting to see it a little more clearly. It's just the Bartner's right and a little bit down from him. There it is. Oh, put on the brakes. Okay. <laughs> Thought you could get away, little light. No, you cannot get away from Bartner. He's the expert at hunting down. We don't need little bits of debris floating about. Bartner, of course, had no trouble getting himself back to the station and installing that light so it would stick there. And then we got him back inside and we will take a look at the fruits of our labor here. All right. Yeah, I don't think... I, I'm pretty pleased with this. This ain't bad. Yeah, and of course, as being the center of our Kerbal presence in space. We will be seeing lots of Kerbin Station in future episodes. But I think this episode is going to be drawing to a close. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.